So good uh, morning, everyone. I'm happy to introduce this seminar by Professor Angela Bonifatti. And uh, let her uh, speak and see you at the end of the lecture. And thank you very much, Angela, for being here. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, still a problem with the, with the, my screen because now I can I, I, I will have to share my screen again. Sorry. Uh, just a second. Uh, thank you, Gian Maria. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> for uh, this opportunity to to present my work uh, to to your uh, to your students and to your colleagues uh, at the University of Padova. So today I will uh, present uh, uh, my work on graph processing uh, systems, big graph processing systems. And in particular, I will uh, focus on um, how these uh, systems can be actually uh, be ready for the future, okay? So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a professor at uh, Lyon One University and affiliated with, with the LIRIS CNRS lab in France. I'm the head of the database group uh, in the same lab. I'm also adjunct professor at the University of Waterloo in Canada in the data systems group. Um, I'm director of, uh, of a new master on data and intelligence for smart systems that will uh, start in September 2022. Uh, uh, in particular, we, uh, we will be able to host uh, second year master students from uh, uh, you know, various universities in Europe. So if you are interested or some of your colleagues are interested, please do not hesitate to spread the word. I have uh, co-authored many publications uh, in the data management field. Uh, uh, two books and uh, an invited paper in ACM Sigmund record in 2018. Uh, uh, this year I've been nominated the program chair of ACM Sigmund 2022, which is one of our top conferences. And I'm also chairing since 2020, the ADVT uh, executive board. Okay, let's start with the topic. Okay, I guess you have already uh, you are already familiar with graphs. Uh, at least if, uh, you have seen it in uh, in the course uh, in a course at the University of Padova. So uh, uh, we believe that uh, graphs are um, um, providing uh, uh, abstractions that uh, can describe. Uh, uh, the connections between uh, different concepts and uh, they are really at the core of uh, uh, tech driving applications uh, that combine uh, data science uh, tasks with the multi-op uh, relationships. In particular, when we see uh, data and uh, the data stays apart and they, it's not connected, then uh, we kind of identify, want to identify the information in this data, but the information uh, can be identified once we uh, understand what are, what are the relationships between the data and the piece of the data. And uh, then we, get, we obtain insights and then wisdom, but uh, uh, it's via the connections and the relationships that we actually uh, get to the result, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, inference and uh, uh, in wisdom from the data. And graphs really help us doing this. In fact, uh, they have been used in many contexts uh, uh, for uh, um, re representing uh, uh, but, uh, data, real world uh, digital phenomenon, but also for uh, providing uh, explanations of this phenomenon and also the predictions and forecasts. And um, th there was a recent survey in VLDB journal uh, uh, in 2020, uh, the others focused on, uh, you know, finding uh, what are the applications domains of, uh, of graphs? And they, they came out with the number. They said that there are 18 application domains uh, that are uh, using graphs. And these are uh, a lot of domains, right? The, the, there is biology, there is security, there is uh, logistics, uh, chemistry, uh, social sciences, and so on. I mean, there are 18 of these. 
And of course, they are used, the uh, uh, graphs are underpinning uh, data management ecosystem in uh, societal uh, scientific uh, product and digital domains, as well as RDF uh, domains. Uh, however, we think that uh, uh, the, the, the data models and the qu querying paradigms that we have right now, they, uh, they are not fixed. We believe that they are going to evolve in the future. And in order to cope with this evolution, then we need to say how the future graph processing systems look like. So there, I was saying there is no one application domain, there is no one killer application. And to, just to make an example, um, there was this uh, graphs for good initiative uh, um, driven by, by many companies, uh, among which uh, Neo4j, uh, which is um, uh, which is a, a graph database company. And uh, they, this initiative uh, is called graph, covidgraph.org. And the idea was to collect in a graph, uh, so in a property graph, the, the information about the pandemic. So uh, this, uh, this property graph is huge. And it, of course, it's, uh, um, it, is, uh, it has been kept uh, up to date with, as, as, uh, um, with, uh, with the, um, you know, the evolution of the pandemic. In fact, if you downloaded it last year uh, and you download it now, I mean, the graph not only has grown, but it has more and more information about the pandemic. And it integrates many, many data sources such as you know, information about uh, what are the most cited uh, others uh, uh, of uh, uh, working on, you know, research, doing research on COVID-19, what are their publications, what are the patents that have been published about the human coronavirus, and then also information about uh, biomedical databases, so omics and genomics, and uh, all the experimental data about the clinic, clinical trials of, um, on uh, treatment for the disease and vaccines, and also the indicators of the, um, you know, the, the outbreak, uh, the, the demographic indicators. Uh, is it COVID uh, um, you, you know, uh, spreading a lot in your area, in your city, in your neighborhood, and so on? So all this information is, uh, is uh, represented with a, with a property graph. And uh, this is an example of uh, how uh, you know, scientists and uh, data scientists can use these graphs in order to uh, you know, perform all kinds of analysis. Yeah? Uh, the, the, right now, uh, you know, the, the analysis that they can do are very, very simple. Uh, in the future, they will be able to do more, like, like they will be able to do a network-based, for instance, uh, drug search uh, or uh, epidemiology, you know, and doing more and more complex tasks. If we understand uh, and help them as computer scientists, we help them to, uh, to actually uh, be able to um, uh, carry out these, um, these complex tasks. Um, so, Let's go back a little bit uh, to the history. Graphs, uh, as also, graphs have been used widely used also with the web, uh, and they are used, you know, for a, a web scale processing. Yeah. So if we start from the very beginning when Google uh, was designed, then there was this algorithm page rank um, uh, that let you find, you know, the the, the, the links that have been uh, uh, pointed, yeah? uh, mo mo most pointed, uh, and then it, it is used to, to actually uh, provide, convey the results of the browser yeah? when, you use, uh, when you use the browser. So the, the, the initial algorithms of uh, Google PageRank, it was uh, evaluated with the, on a map reducer paradigm and uh, very recently uh, in the, like uh, this was in, uh, in the 90s, okay? Then in 2010, they moved to a distributed uh, think like a vertex uh, computation. So they understood that they, they could exploit more the graph paradigm, which the graph underlying graph, which is the web, right? I mean, this huge graph. 
to actually <clears throat> improve uh, their results. And also other companies like uh, big tech companies in the US, such as Facebook, for instance, they also elaborated the more complex computational models. They didn't go as Google for Pregle, which is distributed, but they were like more um, preferring a task-based um, kind of paradigm instead of distributed. And uh, as well as uh, Apache Giraffe. Now, if we look at the, um, you know, the, the uh, kind of uh, uh, success of the graph engines, uh, so this, uh, this is derived from a, from a website that gives you the database engines ranking of graph DBMS. As you can see here, there are a lot that have been designed, you know, let's say in the last 10 years. Yeah? And of course, uh, there are more and more, as you can see in this slide, uh, that, uh, that actually uh, have been uh, proposed uh, either as a commercial system or open source system. And of course, the top ones, uh, the ones that uh, score, uh, have a high score in terms of popularity, they are Neo4j, Microsoft Azure Cosmos, and so on. But there are also other ones that are used, such as Virtuoso, for instance, for RDF processing, uh, Amazon Neptune, which is the underlying graph engines of Amazon, and so on and so forth. So the, there is, a, there is a, an, um, a growing interest in, in, in this technology. Okay, so I was telling you that we can actually enable uh, very complex tasks uh, on uh, uh, graphs such as the covidgraph.org, but how do we do this, right? So we know that uh, um, we, when we look at the graphs and uh, we have to choose a data model, right? So in a sense, we, we are gonna choose, you know, if we're gonna use RDF or gonna use like, uh, uh, a simple labeled graph, or we are going to use a, a property graph, which is more expressive. But it all depends also on how humans look at graphs and conceptualize graphs, right? And also it depends on uh, uh, the in interoperability problem, which means you have many, many data sources. I made this example, I, I was giving this example of the COVID-19 graph in which you have several data sources and they are heterogeneous. So. And when you choose a data model and when you choose a query language, you also have to uh, take into account uh, this, uh, this heterogeneity. So we think that um, uh, you don't have to choose one data model, or at least if you choose one, then the idea is that you will still be able to translate from one data model to another data model. And uh, you, will have, you will be able, by, by using a lattice, for instance, to understand what is the expressive power of your data model compared to other data models. And this will help also users understand uh, how to manipulate the data. And in terms of querying, we also think that one idea would be to come up with uh, new algebras. So in the database community, we have been you know, using the algebra and the algebraic framework uh, uh, as a way to uh, you know, provide a kind of an, an abstraction and uh, you know, um, uh, actually um, uh, um, a, um, a way to, to, uh, to actually uh, deploy the query in the query engine. So we think that for the same can be, can be done for graph workloads in which we can com come up with a new algebra or more algebraic frameworks that actually take into account the heterogeneity and the variety of the graph workloads. So uh, I'm showing you here uh, the, the idea that we had uh, about this uh, future uh, graph processing ecosystems, right? Uh, I will uh, just be uh, go quickly on this slide because we will uh, will uh, come back to it later. But the idea is that exactly what I said. So on the left hand side, you can see there are several data sources that are graph and non graph data sources. Of course, you could have your data as a, a structured relational data, or you could have like textual data. So you have to uh, kind of extract the graph that is. Uh, this is underneath. 
And then you, you have a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, operations and you have engines that actually are able to um, evaluate and process these operations. And you can have uh, classical operations, right? Queries and uh, updates, inserts, deletes, and so on. And you can, uh, these are the OLTP operation, but you can also have more uh, analytical operations like aggregates, you know, uh, uh, more like um, uh, uh, slicing, uh, roll up operations, like more, more data cube operations for graphs. And of course, this is not this processing is not purely linear linear in the sense that you can even have an hybrid between OLTP and OLAP. And the results will serve more advanced processing such as machine learning, uh, augmented reality and visualization and business uh, intelligence. And then as you can see on the on the blue arrow, you can feed back the results of this complex processing back to the to the graph processing ecosystems. And um, it loops back and then until you produce the, the results that you would like. Now, the, the problem is that if we, if we talk to companies like uh, Oracle uh, PGX, Oracle Labs uh, and uh, uh, Neo4j and uh, Tiger Graph, they, they will say something like, you, you know, the, the fact that we can combine data science tasks with multi-hop analysis is actually today is uh, facing a, a combinatorial scaling problem because uh, you, you can imagine it as a maze, right? Every step just uh, help you go deeper in the graph, but then it multiplies the number of choices and the number of cases to consider in the, in the maze. So um, the, the, they say we don't want to that the the, the user is uh, actually overwhelmed with the, this technical challenge. We have to provide systems, uh, graph processing systems that actually make this uh, process, the, this multi-op analysis, actually digestible for the user. And in order to do this, we have to overcome some challenges, and uh, we go over. Uh, so in this talk, I want to go over these three challenges that we have identified uh, for uh, reaching this goal. And these are abstractions, ecosystems, and performance. OK, uh, the challenges, they don't come only from our community. They come from different communities. So they come from computer and distributed systems. They come from uh, Apart from data management, they come from data analytics, uh, visualization, HCI, and then ML and AI and so on. So only if we, we work together with this, uh, these other communities and domains, we can, uh, we can actually face these challenges. Uh, so what I'm saying today has been um, you know, discussed and uh, um, uh, produced uh, as a result of a research seminar in Dagstuhl uh, in 2019, yeah, just uh, in time before the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, on, uh, we had a seminar on big graph processing systems. I was co-organizing it. Uh, with uh, colleagues, with uh, Alex Yosup, who is a distributed system uh, person, and uh, Sheriff Sacker, uh, database person, and Anes Voigt, uh, um, uh, who is working for Neo4j. And uh, the ideas around this uh, future graph processing systems have been conceived there, and then they are part now of a publication that just appeared in the communications of ACM. So you can read the article. It will provide more details uh, about what I'm saying today. Um, and uh, please uh, don't hesitate to, to get back to me if you have any, any questions. OK, let's go over the three uh, challenges. So I will have three parts then in my talk about these three challenges, uh, starting with abstractions. And for each challenge, I'm also describing what we did in our team. Uh, about them. So for the abstractions, let me describe a little bit what it means, right? Uh, so I was mentioning before this lattice of data models. Here you can see uh, the, an instantiation of the lattice, right? You start from the bottom with a simple graph, and then you increase the 
expressive power just to to have the, the most expressive property graphs yeah if you if you see at the top then you will have the uh, neo4j or oracle pgql property graph model uh, when you uh, where you have uh, multiple labels on the nodes but then if you add more so you add multiple labels on the edge then you will obtain this uh, standard the property graph data model which is uh, about to be defined and uh, uh, I, I was mentioning also that uh, usually a data model is uh, has been is uh, is being chosen per application or per use case, but in any case we need to have uh, these uh, different data models to make them interoperable via direct translations or mappings, right? So this is an important uh, challenge for uh, for the future. Uh, just because uh, you know new data models new graph data models can be designed in the future and then if we have this lattice we can uh, actually also study their uh, expressiveness and understandability so just to give you an example maybe the students have already seen this uh, but uh, ju just for the other people who are not very familiar with the property graph so this is an example of a property graphs uh, which is a professional network, right? So LinkedIn, for instance, you can imagine as a LinkedIn. Um, so there are people, huh? the, these people, they are uh, uh, classified based on their expertise. They are novice or uh, apprentice or experts, right? And they have some salary, okay? They have a salary depending on, on, their, uh, on their career and expertise and they know each other or work for each other. Um, and um, they know each other probably since um, maybe one year on the other year. And uh, as you can see here, we have um, for each uh, node and for each uh, edge, we have uh, identifiers. And then we have uh, label. So for the node 10 on the left hand side, you, we have uh, a novice with identifier 10. And then we have a property for this node, the salary of this uh, node is uh, 1K, okay? Um, then we have the same thing on the on the edges, right? So here you can you can see only one label for uh, ed edges and nodes, but you can have multiple labels in the property graphs, right? For the uh, edges and the and the nodes, and then you can see the property, for instance, for the edge uh, number twenty knows so uh, ten knows uh, uh, eleven, yeah, um, since two thousand and sixteen, okay. Um, so if we go formally now, we, we will have to assume that we have a, a pairwise these joint sets of objects and labels and property keys and values. And then we define what is a property graph. So it's a structure, which is a pair of vertices and edges, V and D, where the both edge, set of um, uh, vertices and edges are finite set of objects, yeah? And uh, so they are objectified, yeah? And then we have a function which is eta, which assigns to each edge an ordered pair of vertices, which are the origin and the destination of each edge. Uh, we have a labeling function that assigns to each uh, vertex or edge um, uh, a finite set yeah, um, of labels. And then we have uh, nu. Nu is a, a partial function that assigns to uh, keys, so to properties attached to vertices or edges assigns values, yeah, because the properties they have a key, which is the name of the property, and then the value. Uh, so I was making this example before with the salary, yeah? salary and uh, 1k, so you have a key value pair, okay, for the properties. Okay, um, so you see now we have kind of uh, we have this uh, idea of what are property graphs and uh, we were saying before that the user viewpoint is also very important in fact um, when you choose a data model for instance you are going to choose a property graph you are going to choose the property graph which is which is used in one of these uh, uh, graph databases such as neo4j or oracle for instance then uh, um, the, the user will, uh, will have to um, specify some requirements and then uh, you, you will have to understand the requirements when choosing one or the other data model for a use case or application, right? Um, and uh, the lattice will help us to decide 
you know, to, to make the user aware of this um, cross-model transformation. But then what is important also for the user, and this goes to other communities, right? To NLP, natural language process, is also how you can translate from natural language to graphs, right? And uh, you can have a handful of diverse data models that you can translate to natural languages and back, but these are not applied, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, to property graphs. They have been studied for SQL, yeah, for the relational data model, but they are, uh, they are really not, not uh, investigated yet for, for uh, uh, graph databases. So this could be one idea for uh, future topics for uh, students who want to continue uh, with the research. Uh, in our work, what we did is that in order to uh, get a grasp of the, gra of the, of the graph, so graph, graph uh, instances might be large, so uh, they are difficult to navigate. So in order to um, be able to navigate these graphs, then one way to go is to obtain a summary of the graph and to, to be able actually to do this summarization and to use it, in our case, we wanted to use it for querying, right? So if you take, for instance, uh, in, this, uh, in this figure, you can see the um, uh, linked data benchmark, um, uh, 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 linked data benchmark, uh, which is a property graph that you can generate with the benchmark and represents a social network on, on the left-hand side. And then you can see the way, a way to summarize it, yeah? Uh, that uh, while you obtain the summary, yeah, you actually improve the, the visualization of the graph. And of course, you can use summaries also for other purposes, uh, for instance, for graph mining, for data mining processes. So in our case, we wanted to focus on this summarization and we wanted to have a summary, which is again a property graph, right? So what you can see here on the left-hand side as an example on the, on the, on the LDBC data is, uh, is actually a property graph. So you will have properties that uh, actually uh, describe the summary. So for instance, the frequency of the labels, yeah? because the summary has to be a concise representation of the data. And uh, we summarize the, the graph based on la labeled reachability, right? We are, we are interested in because we want to use it for querying, right? We want to actually encode in the summary the labeled reachability, which is, uh, you know, reachability is a type of query that you have uh, where, where you are going to compute pairs of nodes that are reachable from one from another. But then in our case, it's uh, the uh, labeled constraint reachability. You, you also have labels on the path that you are. Uh, that you are um, uh, actually uh, um, uh, uh, finding on the graph. So in our case, we wanted to have a summary, which is a trade-off between uh, accuracy and expressiveness. And we wanted to use it for approximate query processing. So um, the summary comes with a loss, right? And we want to minimize the, the loss that you have in order to be able to still answer the query, but uh, efficiently. And we compared it with the original, as we're answering the same queries on the, on the original graph. Um, so we focused, as you can see on the, on the right hand side of this slide, we focused on some uh, labeled the reachability queries in which you have a, a simple label, or you, then you have a clean, a clean plus or a clean star, or you might have a disjunction be, between two labels or a conjunction between two labels. In, in general, this problem of finding the minimal summary, so minimizing the number of nodes in the summary and maximizing the connectivity of uh, frequent labels is NP complete. And of course, we came up with the heuristics to actually uh, be able to compute this summary and uh, be able to then evaluate, approximate, approx to do approximate query evaluation of, uh, of these queries. I was mentioning the use of graph summaries in many domains. You, you might be, if you are interested, there is a, um, a, very, a very good survey in uh, ACM computing service, a recent one about this. So here you can see that people have been working on this graph summarization problem. 
and they have been playing with the kind different kind of networks, yeah, static or dynamic networks. For the static, they've been considered plain or labeled networks. And for the dynamic, for instance, which is the case when the graphs evolves over time, over a time interval, they, they just focused on labeled on plain uh, graphs and not, not didn't consider the label it. Of course, this, uh, this survey is from four years ago and we, knew, we know that uh, maybe other, other works have been done in, in between, but still uh, I, I like the way they classify uh, graph summaries. And they also say, you know, they, they, this can be used for many, many applications. So apart from query and algorithms, they can be used for instance, for uh, interactive visualization for uh, noise elimination or volume and uh, storage reduction. And there are a lot of core techniques that are used. Um, so the, the, the way, um, the, way the, the, the summary that I presented before on which we worked was more like a factorized summary, but then you can do this in different ways. You can do it by using compression, for instance, grouping, and so on. Okay, one other idea about the abstractions was about the query languages, right? So we, we just said that you might have a plethora of data models and you might need the lattice to navigate the data models, but then the same applies to the query language, right? If you are gonna choose a property graph, then you are gonna choose the query language. It will be probably Cypher, if you, if you use Neo4j or PGQL, if you use Oracle, or it will be the future uh, SQL PGQ, uh, uh, which is the evolution of PGQL in Oracle, or the graph standard query language, which is actually undergoing. There is a standardization process in which I'm also taking part with the LDBC community to actually design this uh, GQL, uh, which GQL is the counterpart of SQL for relational databases. So you, 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 you might choose also the, the, the kind of operations that you need in the query language. For instance, if you just need the graph pattern and then you just take, you know, you're gonna use this uh, um, uh, um, semantics uh, of uh, graph query language based on non-recursive, no it, it boils down, yeah, if we, if we go back to logical, uh, logical languages such as data log, yeah? We, it boils down to having no recursive data log with the negation. So I, I also make some example of queries that you might have. So if you look, uh, if you have uh, like basic graph patterns, then uh, your queries uh, will look like the first two examples uh, in which you have uh, uh, joins. So they are basically conjunctive queries. So you are looking, for instance, for uh, uh, the first query here, you're looking for uh, um, apprentices that um, works, work for two experts, or you are looking for triangle, uh, you have a triangle query in which you want the, um, the combinations of novice and apprentice and uh, exper experts that know each other in the, on the right hand side, yeah. And uh, below you have a complex graph patterns in which you not only use joins, but you also use recursion. This is something that we call uh, CRPQs, uh, conjunctive regular path queries. And in fact, if you look at this uh, visual representation of the query, we have uh, a, a, a clean plus, a nose plus, yeah? So this query is computing in the novice and the experts uh, where the experts, they are self-employed and uh, uh, they, uh, have been connected to some apprentices by knows plus works for um, pass or knows works for yeah uh, so you you can see what that we are we are using here a, a regular path query in which we are uh, we are using concatenation of labels and then clean plus okay and it's more complex than the first two queries which we just have uh, uh, graph patterns so you will choose uh, the, the, the expressivity of the query language depending on what, you, what your, your application is, um, is actually demanding or your, your use case is actually demanding, right? So 
an idea that we started to have in the book was to actually come up with an algebra for complex graph queries. And these are uh, called in the book, uh, Union of Conjunctive Regular Path Queries. This is a more complex query in which there is, um, we are gonna compute um, for the first rule. So we have in the book, we have this data log like rule rules in which uh, you know if you look at the first rule the first rule is uh, just computing in the set of uh, experts that are known since the year 2000 okay and then you want to you want to return uh, these experts if they have like uh, some uh, they are uh, they are in a, in a relationship with other people who have a, a relationship given by either they know or they work for other people whose salary is uh, um, um, lower than the salary of the expert, which is 5K. Okay, so in the book, we show how by, by extending some operators, uh, such as the join operator and uh, uh, you, you know, the union operator, as we know them in the relational algebra, and then also adding more operators, such as this path operator, which is recursive, you can write an algebra for, uh, for complex uh, graph queries, okay? Um, but this is not um, sufficient. We think that uh, apart from the algebra, then you, uh, you know, experience with the logical reasoning can also help uh, com, uh, you know, um, guide this interplay between um, graph databases and learning. So both statistical learning and some symbolic learning. Um, in particular, we, we think one of the topics for the future is to actually see how we can combine uh, uh, logical reasoning with the graph embedding and that this will help us uh, uh, with the prediction of uh, uh, structures into, into, into graphlets that can be used uh, probably also uh, in query processing uh, by combining then machine learning uh, uh, you know, assets such as the graph neural networks with uh, uh, algebra and logic, okay? Uh, another application would be like, uh, uh, another problem would be, uh, research problem would be to, to actually study these causal inference relationships and use probabilistic models in property graphs to actually see how we can encode the graph neural networks. Again, there is some, uh, some work around this, but uh, there is no connection with the graph database world. So th this, is, this is also quite an idea for future work. I can see there is a mess in the chat. So, uh, do you want me to, to answer? Is there a question? I, I cannot, if I stop, I will have to share the screen again. So maybe, um, Gian Maria, if there is a question, can you formulate it for me? I can, uh, I can take questions. Yeah, now I finished part one on abstraction. So if you want, if you have questions, I can take them now or I can yeah. take them later uh, as you wish. Yeah. Yeah, if there are questions, please. Otherwise, we just go on and we wait till the end. There is one uh, question in the chat, or is this uh, a comment? Uh, there is. Yeah, uh, there is. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Exactly. Yeah, please, Alberto. Uh, a question yes. about uh, um, a graph that we have seen uh, a little bit earlier about the uh, known label that uh, uh, there is a label with no and uh, another one with a plus and uh, I don't understand the difference between uh, these two label. Yeah, okay. So one is, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 one, the no, the plain nose without plus or star. So without clean plus or clean star, you are looking for paths that have length one, right? In the graph. So if you just have nose, right? So you are, you are just looking for one up, okay, in the graph. This is what the query tells you. If you add the plus, you have nose plus, then you are, you, you are looking for arbitrary number of ops, yeah? Because it can be one or more. Yeah, it's like the regular expression, yeah? 
that's why these queries are called the regular path queries because they their paths are uh, annotated with the regular expressions okay so nose plus you are looking for paths of length one or more more than one in the graph so you are you want to return all these paths whatever is 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 their length okay okay thank you so we can uh, also uh, apply it to the graph uh, and not also to the um, to the query um well the, the no the graph uh, you apply to the query so i was showing uh, uh, patterns right so le let me go back here you see uh, yes, in, the, in below, the last uh, in the, the last, last graph. one yeah we, we, you are this is a this is a query pattern is a graph pattern that you you are going to use just to have a visualization of the query uh, the query is the one okay. that you see also as a logical rule in the on the right hand side okay on the graph you don't have the plus or the star yeah because because on the graph yes, in the just... last one there is a plus if you see yes there is a plus that's why i'm calling it a complex graph pattern huh? ah, it's okay different. okay it's different from the first two that are uh, basic graph patterns they are simple there is no plus there is no star okay but this one i'm calling it because there is this plus i'm calling it uh, regular path queries because I start introducing, you know, these regular expressions. So okay. if I introduce okay. in the query these regular expressions, then the expressive power of the query is um, gross. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay. So let's go to part two: the ecosystems. Okay. The, here I I want to go back a little bit to this uh, to this figure. Uh, you know that i already uh, described before and um, you know it's very important that uh, so graphs really can be used uh, you know uh, as a uh, the, the the data model which interacts with the, this uh, advanced uh, process processes such as uh, ml and ai and uh, um, visualization and uh, bi and so on uh, and uh, uh, th this idea of uh, combining uh, OLTP and all our operations and having hybrid between the two is actually actually very uh, an idea that uh, that is um, actually has been you know um, uh, discussed during our uh, seminar in Dagstuhl, but also has been um, uh, what was one of the findings of this. Uh, practical uh, uh, study a survey of on the usage of graphs uh, with the, with the real uh, real users uh, which appeared in uh, VLDB journal 2020 in fact they were expressing their uh, the need of uh, of doing these combinations between OLTP and all of operation the, the way they do it now they do it manually so we think that uh, future graph processing systems they should actually uh, let do these processes uh, uh, and combine these operations, uh, uh, you know, smoothly in uh, in one system. Okay. And uh, to do this, we need complex workflows that are combining this OLTP and all up processing. And uh, the the workflows uh, um, they they have to they have to consider many, many components. So for instance, uh, we have seen the, in this figure, we have seen there is some pre-processing, you know, the extraction of the graphs, then probably there is some uh, uh, data clean cleansing or, data cleansing or uh, uh, ATL processes on the graph. So this is the pre-processing part. Then, then there is these combinations of OLTP and OLAP. And then uh, there are application-driven components. Uh, the application-driven components are this uh, machine learning and uh, AI and the visualization uh, components. So these three parts, they, they are actually part of these complex workloads. And to actually make the, them work, we will have to understand them. And uh, we will have to discuss many, many, many aspects to actually be able to build these uh, ecosystems that are able to uh, process these complex workloads. So, so not only we will have to come up with standard uh, data models and query languages, but we'll also have 
to come up with the reference architectures. We will have to study the scale up versus scale out problem and also consider the dynamic and the streaming endeavors. So for the workloads, we have a diversity of parameters to characterize these complex workloads. For graphs, of course, we have the data models and query models. And then for the queries, we can choose the selectivities, yeah? Uh, because each query will actually um, retrieve a portion of the graph. So is this portion um, uh, uh, linear or uh, uh, quadratic uh, in the size of the graph? Um, and uh, the, the graph and query sizes are also playing a role in the, in the workloads, yeah? Because uh, if you have a small query, yeah, with a basic uh, graph pattern with two nodes, this is different from a query in which you have, uh, let's say, 60, 65 uh, triples, okay? So the size of the queries is also very important. Then you will have to think about, if you think about complex uh, graph workloads, the programming models to choose. If you are gonna choose this uh, distributed thing like a vertex or think like an edge or think like a subgraph, there are many choices there. You have to make a choice and study all possibilities as well. Uh, because uh, if you do benchmarking, then you left a, a lot of query workloads and uh, processes workloads, and you have to put them in one, uh, in one benchmark. Then you, you will have to uh, characterize other parameters. Are this uh, workload regular or irregular? They have like uh, different data sets and algorithms and uh, computing platforms and if they are combining uh, LTP or OLAP and, or they are working on this uh, uh, individually. And there are a lot of tasks in which you can use these workloads. So I already mentioned some of them, but others are like the, the debugging, uh, testing, and then the synthetic graph ge generation. We, we have, uh, there is this trend on also in uh, machine learning to have synthetic data because the machine learning processes, they are really uh, centered around one data set and they want to have, uh, you know, uh, more data sets to try their, their uh, algorithms. And uh, it applies also to, to the problems here to have synthetic graph data. This is very interesting. And then you would have to consider also the, in the workloads, the user viewpoints. So the usability of the workloads, their scalability and the interactivity. So th these are a lot of parameters. I don't want to discuss all of them. I just want to list all of, all of them. There are po possibly others. And then today I will focus on two main topics uh, we have been working on, which are the query sizes and the synthetic graph generation to give an idea of, uh, of uh, uh, how they, they are important as parameters in the workload. So for the query sizes, we have been studying the, the, the queries. We have been like, uh, you know, kind, kind of analyzing and uh, uh, digging like two, 200 million queries from Wikidata, from, from Wikidata, um, which is the database behind the Bpedia. Yeah? And they have a sparkle and points in which users or applications formulate their queries. So we have taken these uh, many, many millions of queries and we have analyzed their size. And here in this, uh, in this uh, histogram, uh, you can see the, the sizes of the queries. So we have split them into organic queries. So what we call organic are the queries uh, formulated by real users and uh, robotic are those that, you, that have correspond to query templates that are used in the API. And uh, we have also classified them into queries that are terminated, that can be evaluated, and those that are timeout, the TO. So as you can see here, uh, you know, the, the organic queries, they, are, uh, they have uh, uh, higher sizes co compared to the robotic queries, at least the robotic uh, queries that are, uh, that are uh, for which uh, evaluation can, uh, can terminate. Uh, because they, they have more, you know, darker colors. So, so the darker colors are those queries that have size greater than 11 triples, okay? So ju just to give you an idea uh, for uh, 
queries that terminate the, the average number of the average size is 2.5 and uh, for those that are time out is higher is 5.6 for instance yeah out of 2 million queries yeah the biggest queries that we found is uh, as a size equal to 67 so you can imagine one of those figures that i gave you before if you had to draw it it, it contains 67 nodes and we found this uh, query 68 times in the logs okay and then we have other statistics you know in the paper about what is the largest uh, length of the regular expression okay so we have a regular expression which is uh, actually long uh, 19 which is a big one okay and the biggest one that we found so to analyze the regular expressions what are the most common regular expressions because uh, of course the, this query with the 19 of, uh, you know the length of the path expression is 19 is uh, one query but uh, the most frequently one path expressions they are very simple they contain one label with a clean star or two labels you see i have highlighted them into into these uh, red boxes yeah where you can see the percentage and then you can have a concatenation of, uh, of labels uh, with the, without clean star, so a one AK at the bottom. These are also very frequently occurring, you just concatenate labels, okay? And uh, this, if we look at the robotic queries, then if we look at the organic queries, the queries formulated by the user, then you, you, it's more complex. So here we use uppercase letters to uh, express alternation in a regular expression. So if you have A or upper, uh, capital A or capital B, then this means that you, that you have, uh, the, the regular expression is not one level, but is the alternation between several levels. So somehow as a human, when we write queries, we don't know exactly what is the label we are interested in. And we are gonna write something, okay, give me these queries if you find, a label uh, uh, L1 or L2 or L3, right? So we use alternation a lot and then under clean star as well. And then concatenation again, combined with the alternation. Yeah, this for, uh, for the organic, uh, organic queries. So as you can see, the sizes and the types, the, the, you know, the types of queries are important and the, knowing what people need because they need them in a big graph database such as uh, Wikidata, then can help us defining, you know, these complex workloads for the graph processing ecosystems. Then we also look at the graph generation. Uh, we, we worked on a survey which appeared in the ACM computing service on graph generators. We look at that several generators from uh, disparate communities, from uh, uh, semantic web, graph databases, uh, social networks, uh, and community detection, as well as general uh, graph theory um, community. And we wanted to classify these, um, these generators because the idea was what, what if you need a graph generator for your application, your use case, well, what are you going to come up with? Then in, if you read the survey, then you will be able to choose the one that you actually fits your, uh, your uh, needs. So we studied the graph generators uh, in different, uh, different angles. So we provide the classification on different, based on different parameters. Is the generator using a schema or not? Is the domain fixed? For instance, there are some generators that just uh, focus on biological data, for instance, right? So, or uh, they are data driven, or they you can you you can write a configuration file in which you you will uh, be able to uh, do graph generation for a, uh, a um, handful of domains. Then what are the operations that are supported, the, the read or they are like read-like read operation or update? Do, are they actually, do they support only queries or also updates? What is the key configuration of, this, uh, of these generators? So overall, we studied uh, something like ab about more than 30 generators in the paper and we provided this classification. I will not spend a lot of time, so in the survey you will uh, be able to look at it, uh, 
and you will able to read uh, what is the classification and um, I hope I hope it, it is useful for your um, for your work. I was also mentioning this graph uh, uh, query language and the data model uh, standardization process, which is driven basically by ISO, uh, IEC uh, committee, uh, the GQL uh, committee, in which there are uh, people from academia and people from uh, uh, graph database companies, as well as big tech companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook and all these people who underneath use a graph database. Sometimes they have their own implementation of a graph database and they even they LinkedIn their own query language. So they are all involved in this discussion, what should be the graph standard data model, the graph standard query language is this GQL. And uh, if you want to know more, uh, just uh, go and uh, read about it in, this, in these links. Uh, these are some of the companies that are uh, involved in, in these efforts. And, um, and then, uh, you know, we out with the, some people, with some colleagues, some researchers in this um, uh, standardization community, uh, people from academia, but also some people from, from companies, we worked on, um, together on a way to define uh, constraints for graph databases. So we look at the existing landscape with this existing graph processing systems. In when, when they want to enforce constraints, then they will have like uh, only support the primary keys for nodes. Some systems will only support the unique constraint. So some system will, on will only support mandatory um, mandatory nodes. But if we want to support all of this, we, there is nothing there. So we wanted to study the problem. How, how about we want to define um, keys for property graphs? And uh, in this paper, we actually have uh, done this effort to get everyone on the same page and um, uh, trying to, to actually meet the requirements of, the, of this uh, of industry in this area. So I want to make an example here, for instance, uh, what, what, what we, we have defined the PG, what we call PG keys, the keys for property graph. So basically the way you do it, uh, uh, here we show a syntax which is very much inspired by Cypher. Uh, but you can you can use any any graph query language to express these keys. Keys you will have to, de to, do, to declaratively specify the scope of the key and the values that on which you are defining the key. So the scope you define it with the for clause, uh, for a within clause, and then uh, the the clause which is called identifier will let you give you the value of the key. So with, with, what is the what is the node, what is the edge on which you are defining the key in a property graph. So for instance, if you have uh, this um, excerpt from uh, LDBC, uh, the social network, the linked data benchmark, you will have, for instance, the first example, you define a, proper, uh, a key for, uh, for a person in, uh, in this social network. So you will say something for P within P of type person, the identifier of, of this person is the login of the person, assuming that uh, each person has a different uh, login in the social network, right? And then you can have more complex uh, examples with more complex scope, like the second one, in which you say each forum that has at least one member, in which at least one person has joined, is identified by the name of the forum and the moderator, uh, the name of the of the moderator. And the forum name and moderator, they are a couple of items that you can use in the definition of the of the PG key. Okay, um, about standardization. So we mentioned this ongoing effort for uh, standardization for uh, query languages and data models, but uh, there is more that is needed if we look at the future, because you might have want standardization for graph algorithms, for uh, 
workflow definitions for graph embeddings, for graph processing benchmarks. You could, you could go and define you know, standards for all these things, but of course then standards need to be adopted by people. And of course, we all know that uh, standards, uh, they are not alive unless uh, people actually adopt them, people and companies adopt them. And that's why these efforts are usually driven by, by companies and by industry, uh, because um, they really have to make a paradigm shift to, to adopt these standards. But we think that standardization is very important here. Uh, I think I'll skip this one is the reference architecture. So if you go at the, look at the uh, CM, CACM paper on the future of big graph, you will find some explanation on this. I want to go to this problem of scale up versus scale out. So, so far uh, people have been used also as, uh, by looking at the survey on uh, usage of graphs uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, various applications with real users. People have been using the scale up. So they, they just, if they want more uh, power, they just increase the power of, uh, of, uh, of memory machines. They use uh, multi-core large memory machines, but in, uh, in the, um, in our vision paper in the CICM, we also think that scale out is, is very important. So in scale out, instead of uh, increasing the power of one machine, then you are going to distribute the graph computation across several machines. And we think that this is very, this is very useful in many, many other cases uh, other than scale up. So for instance, if you have a large scale problem with the uh, trillion edge size graphs, if you have uh, this uh, multi-source graph view computation uh, with very large uh, sizes of the graphs, and if you have uh, also complex processes such as graph embeddings, um, genome sequencing, uh, clustering, uh, and so on. So you know, in all these cases, you, you need uh, to do scale out instead of scale up. And we think, so in, in our vision on the future of big graph, we think that there is no predefined choice. And one has to adapt this scale up to scale out, depending on the underlying infrastructure and the desired performance in a kind of scalability continuum for graph ecosystems. So there is no, there is no uh, one rule fits all solution, but you can, you, you can combine the two and you can choose uh, based on the <clears throat> graph ecosystems that you are building. Then I want to close this chapter on uh, ecosystems with the dynamic and streaming aspects. We have been working on this as well. So basically uh, dynamic graphs, that they, these are graphs in which uh, you can have updates and you have querying on all the new states. So your query language actually allows you to um, actually retrieve the new and the old state yeah, uh, in, the, in the database. Whereas streaming graphs are graphs when you are receiving one edge at a time, for instance, right? And uh, those graphs are unbounded, yeah? They are not, um, they, they are not finite, yeah? And they arrive at high speed. And both types of graphs, they, they have been like uh, very uh, seldom, um, uh, you know, addressed in existing systems. So if you take, for instance, Jelly or Apache Flink, they just focus on uh, streaming for uh, using aggregates and projection, but they don't, they are not able to evaluate um, basic graph patterns or complex graph patterns with recursion of the kind that I was showing before. So we were working on this and we were focusing on uh, this problem of evaluating complex queries on uh, uh, streaming graphs. As you can see here, so the graph uh, uh, along the time axis, you will have an edge at a time. So the graph doesn't exist at the very beginning, but it will, build, it will be built on the fly. Uh, so for instance, uh, at, at time 12, when you receive uh, the, the, last, uh, the last edge, yeah, here you can even delete an existing edge, you will have this graph which is, uh, which is there. So you, you are not 
you don't know the, the, the graph in advance, but the graph is built on the fly. And the, 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 streaming is, the stream is unbounded. You don't see everything at the very beginning. And of course, in the future, you will see more and uh, you have to make some assumption, assumptions. And the streaming rates can also be very high. Uh, so, so in our case, we focused on this model, which is called the sliding window, in which you have a window-based semantics. So the window is sliding, so you will have to use the window to actually do batch computation. And then we, have, we are able to evaluate uh, the queries with this continuous uh, semantics. So as edge come in the stream, they are batched. And uh, there we can uh, actually support both complex and simple operations. So for instance, we, we can evaluate these regular path queries in which we, we can use uh, regular expressions. So this is an example, for instance, of a query. You want to have paths in which you have follows, follow, follows concatenated with mentions uh, with the arbitrary number of ops. And uh, here you can assume um, uh, two semantics. You can assume the simple pass semantics or the arbitrary pass semantics. And we have addressed the boss in our paper so you, in the simple pass, you cannot traverse a node twice, whereas in the arbitrary pass, you, you can actually traverse a, a node multiple times, and then you have this problem of loops, okay? And depending on which one you choose, then you will have different complexity and the different results in the, in the performances of the queries. And I'm done with chapter two on the ecosystem. So if there are questions, I can take them now. And otherwise I will conclude with the performance. So Gian Maria, if there are questions, could you please read them for me? Because I otherwise I cannot click on the chat, unfortunately. Yeah, on the chat there is nothing. So okay. we can see if there are questions from the audience. Usually they just talk so they don't use the chat very much usually okay so, okay uh, yeah well, if, i don't think there are if questions. you have questions you can you can uh, raise your hand um... okay so let's go ahead yeah i will um then then go on to the third part the performances so one other challenge for future graph processing systems is uh, performances uh, this part was uh, actually, you know, in the seminar was discussed with Alex Yosup and his colleagues because the, they are from, they are not from data management, they are more like from computer systems and distributed systems. So they see graphs from another angle, which is, in my opinion, very interesting. So, and uh, they focused on uh, um, you know, the metrics that we should use to, to actually have good performances, right? For a graph processing systems, so what are the, how to improve these large scale experiments? Um, uh, because sometimes, you know, when, you, when, you, when they build these large scale experiments, then they have to assume uh, a certain amount of time of a certain amount of resources. And then these experiments, they cannot be reproduced elsewhere. Uh, so they, they really think that reproducibility is very important when we do uh, graph processing. And, um, and then they, they, have, uh, uh, they want to uh, actually correlate the complex run times. So I was showing you these queries that uh, do not, uh, that are timed out, that do not terminate. So it, it, why they don't terminate, right? We don't know what was the problem. Was the problem related to some, to software, to hardware, you know, to some system parameters? So they, this is what they study. What, what, what is the, the problem there with complex processes, complex runtimes, yeah? And then this makes, uh, the, this leads to a, a question how do we actually make sure that we have uh, we are able to measure performances and we are able to reproduce large scale experiments yeah and this is what we discuss in the vision uh, the, there is this problem that uh, the we cannot do benchmarking if there is a lack of interoperability there are a lot of community if we want to do benchmarking uh, seriously we have to involve many many communities so uh, in 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 the 
we, we, come, we will come up with a solution, but it's a difficult process. I will describe just a little bit one, um, one of the shelf solution which can be provided to, to benchmarking uh, queries, yeah? because this is my area. And uh, when, when you want to compare performances of graph queries on predict graph queries across systems, then you have to consider the indexes that are used by these systems. So for in, in our opinion, like in the data management field, we, we believe that the indexing or sampling, for instance, more from data mining viewpoint can help with the, this comparison of the performances of of graph queries. So for sampling, for instance, there, there is a nice, uh, nice paper in KDD uh, a few years back about this sampling from, uh, from large graph. Uh, the, the goal there was, of course, not for property graphs, not for graph databases, but the goal there was to compare different uh, sampling strategies and to understand which one are better than the other. And how to do the uh, how to scale up the measurements of the sample to to obtain good uh, estimations of the of the for for large graphs uh, and of course we they they didn't uh, focus on uh, uh, complex graph queries uh, you know they they focused on more like uh, graph uh, operations such as uh, between a centrality shortest path. So one idea was one idea could be how to use sampling for you know our operations yeah for the for graph queries and complex graph queries. Another idea is about indexing. So in our community, we have been already looking at indexing for complex queries. So if you have alternation of labels, so L1 or L2 or LK, what what is called LCR queries, yeah, uh, with a disjunction, then there are uh, proposals for indexes. Uh, many of these proposals, they rely on this generalized uh, transitive closure uh, definition uh, in, in which uh, you, we are going to compute this minimal label set from U to V, uh, the, the set of levels where the elements uh, uh, cannot be removed uh, any longer. Uh, and then we, when, once we have this GTC, yeah, the, the transitive generalized transitive closure, then we are going to compress it uh, uh, and use it as an index for efficient query processing. This is one solution. And of course it works for the above, above kind of queries with the alternation with the union of labels under a, a clean star or a clean plus. But then we have many more queries. So recently with the postdoc, um, we have been working uh, uh, with, uh, with people from Oracle uh, on this problem of how to evaluate queries that contain concatenation instead of alternation and how to come up with, uh, with an index for those. Uh, so the idea was to, to be able to, to use this index, uh, which is called the recursive label con concatenated index, uh, um, to, 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 to check out uh, whether uh, um, a, a query is evaluated to true or false. Yeah? If, if we have a reachability query with a, with, a, with a condition that there is a concatenation of labels under a clean star, then we are able to evaluate using the index because these queries are very expensive to evaluate uh, on, um, on the graph instances and the index really accelerate the processes. And the previous approaches, including this generalized transitive closure are not able to evaluate these queries, okay. Okay, so just to conclude on the performances, so there are open problems there too. So uh, how do we make performance measurement and testing um, easier? How do, define the, how do we define these metrics to execute a graph query or a graph algorithm and to be able to, or, or a, a, a workflow and to compare um, uh, across systems? how to generate heterogeneous graph workloads. So OLTP and uh, OLAP and batch and streaming and temporal and spatial and so on. 
and how to uh, benchmark these graph uh, processing pipelines and ecosystems that include the pre-processing, that include, um, you know, uh, pro processes with OLTP and OLAP and include advanced uh, um, processes such as um, machine learning and simulation and so on. So how do, do we build a benchmark that actually is for the entire pipeline? This is an open question as well. All right, so I conclude with Doc. Yeah, I've used uh, many, many pictures from this movie. I, I hope you like this movie as I do, uh, um, Back to the Future. Uh, so, so as a Doc, I agree with Doc. Yeah, uh, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. And um, I, I want to do some advertisement. So, uh, for the students, yeah, I, I don't have it in the slides. So we have openings uh, for um, master thesis and then for PhD thesis on this topic, graph processing systems. And for the um, for people who have already a PhD, uh, we are looking. We also have job openings uh, next year. So we have uh, two job openings. One is the uh, Conseil National de Recherche Scientifique. Uh, as um, a research uh, researcher, so a pure research position, no teaching, uh, and the application deadline is soon. So if, you, if any of you is interested or you know colleagues who are interested, please do not hesitate to spread the word. And then in, in my team, we have an associate professor with chair uh, with the reduced teaching load and a chair of 200K. Um, for starting, uh, you know, a new topic and uh, then I PhD student, uh, um, uh, which, uh, which is supposed to be hired by September 2022. And this person can teach in French, in uh, English, sorry, on the, um, in the new master uh, that we have been, we, we are uh, planning to op open, sorry. Thank you. And uh, Q&A, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm... Uh, Thank you very much, Angela. And let's see if there are questions. I'm sorry, I have to stop sharing because I, I cannot see the chat and I would, would like to see if, uh, what is yep, yep. the chat. Yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm checking it, so. Yeah, okay. Don't worry. But I can share again, yeah, this. Uh... Okay. So, oh, there is also Nicola. Hi, Nicola. Hello, Nicola. Hello, Angela. How so, are you? Fine, thanks, and you? Good. <laughs> so I have a question about yes, uh, go ahead. The, the reproducibility. Mm. Uh, I've been working uh, uh, for, on it for years in, in IAR, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pain. Uh, what about uh, your, your area? I mean, is it only a matter that uh, the, the graphs are big, so it's difficult to run experiments or uh, there is also any issues with uh, bad practices, uh, code which is not uh, up to uh, really be rerun or whatever. Both issues, I think, right? I mean, what we were discussing in the CACM paper was more like uh, related to how to compare uh, you know, if you have, um, uh, if you if you have, if you want to compare, if you want to reproduce the results, and you want to compare, uh, you know, the, the execution of your processes across different systems, then you, of course, you need to be reproducible. In in a scientific community, like in a data management field, there is also this issue of, uh, you know, when you submit a paper. A research paper, then you have to provide the code. We have this artifacts availability. This doesn't, doesn't only apply to graph processing. Of course, for graph processing, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that we have this uh, um, large data sets. Yeah? Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, when you submit a paper now, now you have to provide code. It's not mandatory, but it's uh, recommended. There is this artifacts availability. It has been introduced in many, many conferences, VLDB, Sigma, and so on. So you have to say, where is the code of the paper? And the reviewers can look at it. And um, this is also related to what you said, Nicola, the bad practice. You know, I, when I started my PhD, this was a long time ago, right? Uh, more than 20 years ago. 
I remember I was working on XML. You might also remember about it. And there was nothing, if I wanted to compare my work with the, you know, some existing work, if I, I wanted to contact the others, <clears throat> then I would never get the code. Uh, you know, because the others were saying, oh yeah, but our code is not clean, it's not yeah. ready for sharing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have the same problem in our community. I agree with you, reproducibility is a pain. So this artifact availability is optional and it's not about reproducibility. In Sigmod, for instance, there is a reproducibility committee. If you have a paper accepted in Sigmod, you can have this reproducibility stamp from ACM, but then you have to submit it to a reproducibility committee. And they are going to look at the code and they are going to, you know, give you yeah, this yeah. stamp. But, uh, but, but it's a problem. I mean, uh, Angela, I'm chairing the same committee on the reproducibility for the Sigayara. Uh, toys and yes, yeah, yeah. I guess you have the same problem in your community. Yes, yes it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's also hard to, to have people do the extra work needed to submit to such a committee. Especially exactly. Now that In fact, there, are, there is an archive, everyone wants to be super fast in putting out uh, things. So it's really. Yeah, our field is evolving, um, you know. A lot. I mean, like uh, we are uh, among the scientific fields, we, we are one of the most evolving fields and keeping pace with all this. And it's a lot of work for a producibility committee to check all, all the code. Uh, the, there are some conferences who are not, uh, you know, um, asking the others whether they want to participate. They are obliging others of accepted, accepted papers to do it, yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is also a lot of work because I've heard from some colleagues, these are not the, in the data management conference, but other fields that I've heard they had papers accepted and the PhD student has to spend like, after the paper is accepted because it's mandatory to be reproducible, he has to spend other six months exactly on how to make the code reproducible. And the committee was asking questions, you know, about the code. How do you do this? And what if you do this instead of that? You know, I mean, even fixing the code in some case, you know, so it's a big issue. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. All Thank right. you. I think that maybe Gianmarco or Alberto, they, they started the webcam. Maybe they had a question or not, just, just checking. No? No, no, for me, no. No, okay. Neither for me. Okay. Are there other considerations, questions? No, okay. Why you think about it? Well, actually time's up, almost up. And so Angela, thank you very much for this talk. Thank I you for uh, inviting me and uh, I'm, uh, you know, available if you want to have any discussions on this topic i would be very very interested okay of course of course of course and thank you for also the um, information about the master thesis and possible internships i think yes. students might be interested so talking to them now if you like these topics as i think and you told me and you might want to cooperate and work with Angela and her group together with us, whatever, just raise your hand and we can discuss it and maybe exchange a few emails and see where it goes. But okay, now you are, um, you, you let have- them, uh, Let them think about it, yeah. Uh, so internships are paid in France huh, by, by law. The, we cannot hire a master student doing internship in our lab if we don't pay him or her. It's not okay, a lot of so money. It's not a lot of money, but it gives you some money, you know, to pay the rent and, uh, you know, the, so we are obliged to, to pay um, interns, yeah, here, so. Okay. And, and this is also a further motivation, I think, and, and the, the great, great news. Uh, in Padua, you are not paid, but you live I here, know, so I know, I did my internship in Italy. <laughs> 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 sure, but, but I think it's 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 further interesting. So yeah, uh, yeah with this course, I think that uh, also the internship you 
um, proposed us in Oracle. I shared with the students yeah. that opportunity. This is, uh, this is paid high. even more because this is industry. This is a, like a big yeah. salary. This is a big salary. And they let you also work remotely. So think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We read that. <laughs> Requirements were a bit high, I think, but maybe some of yeah, them are very Yeah, they're very picky. Mm. Yeah, they're not going yeah. to. But you can, you can go through the interviews and see whether, uh, you know, the students, they can also participate in the interviews and maybe they... They, they will be able to make it yeah so yeah yeah and, and it's also formative just to do the interviews just to see how it goes and what yeah. they ask yeah so it might be very interesting but they, just to give you an idea these are paid like a uh, salary of uh, assistant professor uh, in france or in italy right <laughs> yeah 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 totally totally so <laughs> think about that <laughs> think about that and and thank you again. I think no problem. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again for we'll the invitation. Keep in touch, of course. And bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Nicola. Bye. <laughs>